World War I not only had an impact on the causes of World War II, but it also had an impact on the way the war was fought. Germany had learned from the 1918 offensive that in order to break through the enemy's ranks, concentrated attacks by stormtroopers along with tactical air cover were critical. In fact, generals in Britain, France, and Germany had all written about the need for rapid mobile attacks based on large numbers of tanks, but it was German leadership that put these theories into practice. The result was Blitzkrieg. Now, instead of the defensive war of World War I, there was an offensive war that consisted of surprise, speed, and movement using tanks, armored vehicles, mechanized transport, and airplanes. An airstrike took out the opposing air force and communication centers on the ground, and parachutists were dropped behind enemy lines. The swift-moving tanks and motorized infantry, supported by air power, would then split the enemy lines and allow rapid penetration into unprotected territories beyond, with the aim of encircling the main enemy forces and destroying them. Thus, a rapid, decisive victory was achieved. Although many historians now doubt that Blitzkrieg was a coherent, well-thought-out strategy and believe that it was more of an improvised response, it was nevertheless well-suited to Hitler's needs. He was not expecting a major war in 1939. His planning was for a widespread European war in 1943 to 45, and in 1939, the German economy was not yet ready for the demands of a long war. Thus, Blitzkrieg allowed Hitler to achieve quick victories that were not too demanding in terms of casualties and resources. The speed and surprise elements of Germany's success prevented other countries from mobilizing fully for total war and had a devastating impact on morale. Up until 1941, Blitzkrieg in Europe was very successful. Although the German army was not superior in terms of actual equipment, the surprise of Blitzkrieg attack against an enemy that lacked the same levels of organization and morale allowed for dramatic German victories. Operation Barbarossa, however, showed the weakness of Blitzkrieg. Despite massive advances in the first six months, the German army was not sufficiently equipped to deal with such a large operation. The circumstances in which Blitzkrieg was effective, short wars in confined areas, did not exist in the USSR. With its huge areas of land and resources, the USSR was able to withstand the initial losses, reorganize its economy and military, and fight back. By 1943, Germany had lost the key surprise element of Blitzkrieg, and its enemies had learned from their initial mistakes of 1939 to 41. The Allies increasingly fought a war in the same attacking style as the Germans, with heavy use of tanks, mobile vehicles, and, most importantly, air power. From 1944, the Allies had dominance on the skies on all fronts. For Britain, naval power was critical for maintaining the vital trade routes on which the British population depended for survival. It also allowed Britain to defend its empire and was essential to any army operation outside of home waters. Thus, until 1944, Britain fought mainly a naval war. Yet even more so than in 1914 and 18, sea warfare was no longer about battles between large fleets and huge battleships. German naval prestige suffered a blow after scuttling of a ship in 1939 and sinking of the prestigious battleship Bismarck in the Atlantic in 1941. German capital warships were then removed from the Atlantic. As a result, there was no major surface engagements in the Mediterranean and Atlantic that compared to the Battle of Jutland in World War I. Sea warfare was now about controlling supply lines, and from 1940 to 1943, Britain and Germany fought to see who could dominate the Atlantic. Although the German U-boat fleet was small in 1939, it was developed quickly. Hitler needed the U-boats to keep Britain and the U.S. occupied while Germany was tied up in the Soviet Union. 
They were also a possible way of defeating Britain outright, and at first the German U-boats were very successful. In 1941, submarines sank 1,299 ships, and in 1942 they sunk an additional 1,662 ships, with a total tonnage of almost 8 million tons. By 1943, Britain's survival was being severely threatened by the losses of Allied shipping. To combat the U-boats, the Allies had both to avoid them and attack them. Both strategies depended on precise knowledge of the position and movement of the U-boats. Fortunately for the Allies, mid-1943 saw the culmination of several factors that allowed them to do this, thereby eliminating the U-boat as a decisive threat. First, Britain was able to crack the Enigma Code. Also in 1943, the codes of the Royal Navy were changed after it was discovered that the Germans had been deciphering them all along. Thus, from mid-1943, the Allies had an intelligence advantage. Also, by May 1943, convoys were protected by various technical innovations, which included the use of high-frequency direction finder, also known as Huff Duff, which provided an accurate bearing towards any submarine that used its radio. Also, air power was used effectively to attack U-boats. Long-range Liberator aircraft with shortwave radar and searchlights were able to pick out the U-boats on the surface at night. Small aircraft carrier escorts started accompanying the convoys to give protection when the Liberators were unavailable or out of range. In 1943, 149 out of the 237 German vessels sunk were victims of aircraft. So as a result, by the end of 1943, it was clear that the Allies had won the battle for the Atlantic. The historian Richard Overy points out that the importance of the British and American willingness to recognize and undertake a revolution in maritime strategy, something that the Germans were reluctant to do. After 1943, the Allies also managed to produce more ships than were being lost, thanks to the dramatic increase in U.S. shipping. The German military used the Enigma cipher machine during World War II to keep their communications secret. The Enigma machine is an electromechanical device that relied on a series of rotating wheels or rotors to scramble plain text messages into incoherent cipher text. The machine's variable elements could be set in many billions of combinations, each one generating a completely different cipher text. The recipient of the messages would know how the machine had been set up, so could type the cipher text back in. The machine would then unscramble the message. Without knowing the Enigma setting, the message would remain indecipherable. The German authorities believed in the absolute security of the Enigma. However, with the help of Polish mathematicians who had managed to acquire a machine prior to the outbreak of World War II, British codebreakers stationed at Benchley Park managed to crack the Enigma code. The revolutionary effect of aircraft and sea warfare was demonstrated even more clearly in the war with Japan. Japan used air power highly effectively at the start of the war in the attack on Pearl Harbor and also against British and Dutch ships in the Pacific. Like Germany, Japan hoped to intercept Allied shipping to prevent any reinforcements reaching the Pacific. It also hoped to destroy the rest of the U.S. fleet. However, the Americans had huge shipbuilding capacity and also had realized, even before the Europeans, that aircraft were vital to naval combat. Thus, the U.S. already had large aircraft carriers out the outbreak of war. American ships also had radar and access to Japanese codes. These factors were crucial in their success at the Battles of the Coral Sea in Midway in 1942. The loss of Japanese carrier force in the Battle of Midway put the Japanese into a position from which they could not recover, recover given their limited shipbuilding capacity. Naval warfare played a key role in both the course and the outcome of World War II. 
In Europe, the German U-boat campaign, as well as bringing the British close to subsistent levels of existence, delayed the opening of a second front, preventing the buildup of American forces in Europe until after 1943. Taking routes to avoid U-boats also made getting supplies to the USSR and the Allied armies in Africa much more difficult than it would normally have been. The victory of the Allies in the battle for the Atlantic was vital, therefore, in allowing Britain and the U.S. to prepare for D-Day. John Keegan, a historian, writes that, had it been lost, the course, perhaps the outcome of the Second World War, would have been entirely otherwise. The victory of the Allies on the seas also allowed them to impose crippling sea blockades on Italy and Japan, which dramatically affected the industrial strength of these countries and prevented them from sending out reinforcements to other fronts. Both the war on land and the war at sea were transformed by aircraft. Both sides used aircraft as tactical support for armies on ground. Radio communication was used to coordinate air support with ground attack aircraft attacking enemy strong points, supply lines, troops, and vehicles. At sea, aircraft were now used to attack surface vessels and also submarines, as well as to protect convoys. In supplies and reconnaissance, aircraft were also applied to great effect. Supplies were now dropped by aircraft, as were soldiers in several campaigns, and aircraft were essential in supplying partisan movements behind enemy lines. Camera technology was greatly improved through the course of the war, making photo recon aircraft even more effective. Aircraft were used for identifying troop movements and also targets for bombing. While aircraft played a supportive role, World War II also saw an even more radical and independent use for aircraft in strategic bombing. This type of bombing focused on destroying the military and industrial infrastructure of a country. It could also, however, be directed against civilians in an attempt to crush civilian morale. By focusing on the home front, the strategic bombing blurred further distinction between combatant and non-combatant and its use in World War II remains highly controversial. At the beginning of the war, the Royal Air Force was forbidden from indiscriminate bombing, and in fact, both sides held back from being the first to attack cities directly in Western Europe. This policy changed when a German aircraft crew bombed East London in mistake, which was followed with a retaliatory raid by Churchill against Berlin. Hitler used the Berlin attack as an excuse to launch a full-scale air assault against London and other British cities called the Blitz. Apart from retaliation for the Blitz, the switched area bombing by the British and Americans was also caused by the fact that precision attacks on German industrial targets in daylight led to high casualties and localized nighttime attacks were too inaccurate. In addition, strategic bombing allowed the Allies to show Stalin that they were playing their part in the war. The key advocate of the bombing campaign in Britain was Sir Arthur Bomber Harris, who was appointed Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command at the beginning of 1942. Initially, bombing raids on Germany did not bring about the results that Bomber Command hoped for, and the high losses of the RAF planes in 1942 and 43 were making the strategy unacceptable. The efforts on parts of Germany were still hor horrific. 40,000 dying in Hamburg in a firestorm, for instance, but they did not lead to the collapse in civilian morale and German industrial production continued to rise in 1944. However, with the introduction of the P-51B Mustang in 1944, the bombing campaign became far more devastating. This plane was fitted with auxiliary fuel tanks so that it could accompany the bombers all the way to the target. It was thus able to take on German fighters, causing huge losses in German planes and giving the bombers easy bomber runs. In February and March 1944, the Germans lost a total of 900 fighters, a situation from which they never recovered. By June 1944, the Allies had total air superiority.
With the Luftwaffe defeated, Bomber Command was able to bomb in daylight and to carry out precision attacks on industrial targets such as the steel industry in Ruhr. The U.S. Army Air Force or the USAAF bombed almost exclusively in the daylight. Previously, the RAF largely bombed at night, while the Americans took over in the day. However, cities in eastern Germany, such as Dresden and Leipzig, were also attacked in the spring of 1945. Joint Anglo-American attacks on Dresden in February 1945 created a fighter storm that killed approximately 50,000 civilians. The Germans, who lacked a proper strategic bomber force, responded to the Allied attacks from 1945. 44 with the V-1, a pilotless flying bomb, and the V-2 ballistic missile. These were targeted at London and did cause significant casualties. They could not be mass-produced, however, and were unreliable and inaccurate. They also came too late in the war to have any effect on the outcome. In fact, the rocket project did not help the German war effort, as it used up resources that would have been better spent on building more fighter planes. Japan was also subjected to intense bombing. From November 1944, the USAAF, flying from the captured island bases of Saipan and Guam, began relentlessly hitting the Japanese mainland. Initially, they carried out precision attacks on aircraft factories, but these gave way from March 1945 to area bombing using mainly incendiary munitions. The results were horrific for Japanese civilians living in houses made mainly of wood, bamboo, and paper. In an attack on Tokyo on March 9, 1945, B-29s flying from Iwo Jima destroyed a quarter of the city, one million homes, and killed approximately 80,000 people. And in fact, in six months between April and August 1945, 21st Bomber Command, under the direction of General Curtis LeMay, devastated most of Japan's major cities. Terrified Japanese fled to the villages. Absenteeism in factories rose to 50%. A combination of sea blockade and bombing devastated the economy and left Japan on the verge of defeat. However, the ultimate expression of strategic bombing came with the use of two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after which Japan surrendered. Thus, it was air power alone that caused the final collapse of Japan. No land invasion was necessary. There have been two major criticisms made against strategic bombing, that it was morally wrong and that it was ineffective. With regard to the first point, the justifications given by the Allies were that the Germans had started it. Churchill even quoted Hosea 8-7 saying, now those who sow the wind are reaping the whirlwind. That was his only means that Britain had of hitting back at Germany and that it would help in the war more quickly was also stated as reasons. It was thus a strategy of necessity, yet critics at the time and since 1945 maintained that the devastating effects on civilian populations did not justify such use of bombing. With regard to its effectiveness, there is again much controversy. Some historians argue that a dramatic drop in German production in 1944 and 45 was due to attacks from the Bomber Command, while other historians argue that Germany's declining production figures were owed as much to the general attrition of the war as to the bombing. Richard Overy wrote in Why the Allies Won, there has always seemed something fundamentally implausible about the contention of bombing critics that dropping almost 2.5 million tons of bombs on a tightly stretched industrial systems in a war-weary urban population would not seriously work weaken them. Germany and Japan had no special immunity. Japan's military economy was devoured in flames. Her population desperately longed for escape from bombing. German forces lost half their weapons needed at the front. Millions of workers were absent from work, and the economy gradually creaked almost to a halt. 
Bombing turned the whole of Germany into a gigantic front. It was a front the Allies were determined to win. It absorbed huge resources on both sides. It was a battlefield in which only the infantry were missing. The final victory of the bombing in 1944 was the greatest lost battle on the German side. For all the arguments over the morality or operational effectiveness of the bombing campaigns, the air offensive was one of the decisive elements in Allied victory.